so um, I'd like to welcome you to this um, webinar series titled Post Philosophies and the Do Doing of Inquiry. This is the 14th. We were just saying we, that we can't believe it. It's the final webinar of the series. And we've, Candice and I and Erin have really enjoyed hearing from a, a range of scholars that we've had with us over the last 14 months. This free webinar series meets monthly, for those of you who don't know, on the topic of post-qualitative inquiry and the doing of inquiry, inspired by a range of post-philosophies. Each session involves one or two international guests who have experience with inquiry approaches inspired by post-philosophies such as post-humanism, post-structuralism, affect theories, feminist new materialism, and post-colonialism. I'm Viv Bozalek, and I'm co-hosting this webinar with Candice Kuby. The webinar series was made possible by a collaborative partnership between the University of Missouri System and the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa. The partnership between our universities started in 1986 and funding for the webinar series is provided through the University of Missouri South African Education Program Committee, which supports academic exchanges between the University of Missouri system and UWC and provides opportunities for teaching and learning research and community engagement between the two universities. Candice and I are very grateful for the support and for the long-time collaboration between our universities. These webinars that you may already know are also available on YouTube, which you can find on the website if you want to access them. And you can also subscribe to the YouTube series. Um, you can also see that there's a, an option on that YouTube for closed captioning. So you can get the written transcript of the webinar. And we also excited to share that the webinar series um, will become two special issues in the journal Qualitative Inquiry that will happen um, in 2022. So over time, the panelists will pub publish their webinar in article format. Um, and I'm sure you'll hear more about that. Um, we will also, I wanted to just tell people that we're going to be starting a new series of webinars called Doing Higher Education Differently in Conversation with Neuroatypicality, which will also follow um, from this one on every third Thursday, starting at the usual time. And we're going to be starting with Erin Manning on the 14th of October. And we would be very delighted to see you there. So today, uh, we're very pleased to say that our panelist is Maggie McClure. And Maggie, would you just like to say a couple of words about yourself? You're still muted, Maggie. I think I've unmuted myself now. Yes, I'm Maggie McClure, um, now Professor Emerita from Manchester Metropolitan University, but still very much engaged in the uh, doing and thinking of uh, inquiry. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Although, as I said to Candice and Viv and Erin, uh, it's pretty daunting coming at the end of the long list of very auspicious speakers that this excellent series has had. So it's a real privilege, but it's also kind of scary. Thank you. Well, we're very pleased that you're ending the series, I must say. Thank you. So I'd also like to introduce Erin Price. Erin um, Price is a PhD student at the University of Missouri, where she serves as a graduate research assistant with me. Erin is an artist and art educator with experience coordinating preschool through secondary art education in the US and abroad. Erin is particularly interested in the role of material invitations and affect and artistic encounters and the becomings of identity and community. Um, as we've said at each webinar, we are thrilled to have Erin as part of our team. She's providing a lot of the technical support to make the webinar series happen. 
She also has um, created the beautiful artwork that's a part of our webpage and all of our promotional materials. And so thank you for sharing your artist talents with us. And she also is the one who gets these recorded sessions up on YouTube for others to enjoy. So thank you so much, Erin, for all of your assistance and your expertise in the webinar series thus far. Thank you, Candace. It has been my pleasure to be a part of this series. And as Maggie said, there's just been an incredible uh, array of, of panelists. So I, it's been a pleasure to be a part. Now to introduce our two co-hosts. Dr. Candace Kuby is a professor of learning, teaching, and curriculum at the University of Missouri. She's also department chair and serves as the director of qualitative inquiry. Dr. Kuby's research interests are the coming to be of literacies when young children work with artistic and digital tools and approaches to and pedagogies of qualitative inquiry when thinking with post-structural and post-humanist philosophies. She is the co-author of several books, including Posthumanism and Literacy Education, Knowing, Becoming, Doing Literacies, and Disrupting Qualitative Inquiry, Possibilities and Tensions in Educational Research. Her scholarship appears in journals including Qualitative Inquiry, Journal of Literacy Research, and Cultural Studies Critical Methodologies. Dr. Vivian Bozilek is an Emerita Professor in Women's and Gender Studies at the University of the Western Cape. She is also an honorary professor in the Center for Higher Education Research, Teaching and Learning at Rhodes University. She holds a PhD from Utrecht University. And her research interests in publications include the political ethics of care and social justice, innovative scholarly practices in higher education, and post-qualitative and participatory methodologies. Her most recent co-edited books include Post-Anthropocentric Social Work, Critical Posthumanism and New Materialist Perspectives from 2021, and also Higher Education Hauntologies, Living with Ghosts for a Justice to Come. We're just so thankful to have you both um, and for the work that you've done and the vision that you have for this series. Thanks very much, Erin. I'm just going to give a bit of an overview of the Zoom process. As you might have noticed, we, we're using the Zoom webinar platform, not the meeting platform. So only hosts and panelists have the video and audio functions. And as we mentioned, we are recording this webinar, webinar for public viewing later on YouTube. The chat function is open for you to connect, and I see some of you already have with other attendees during the webinar. But if you do have questions, can you please put them through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen? So that's going to make it easier for Erin and I to moderate the questions if they're all in the Q&A. Um, and do, if you haven't already, take a moment to locate that button. This is what's going to be happening in the webinar as usual for the first 30 to 40 minutes Candice is going to interview Maggie on the four main questions which is our common thread for all the webinars in the series and you can also find them on our web page and also while discussing these questions she might um, Maggie might share examples from her scholarship and there were four suggested readings. She might be referring to these and they were posted on the website. And then Candice will spend some time ask, talking to Maggie about how she mentors graduate students who are also engaging in post philosophies in the doing of inquiry. And then last of all, we will open up space for questions from people attending to Maggie. And we hope to have about 30 minutes for this. So we're going to invite you to put your questions there throughout the webinar. You know, when, when, they, when anything strikes you, please do feel free to, to just put them in and we'll deal with them at the end. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Candice, who's going to be interviewing Maggie today. Thanks, Viv. 
Well, we did a brief bio or a brief introduction to Maggie earlier, but I want to give a, a more complete and fuller picture of Maggie um, before we jump into our four questions. So as many of you already know, I'm sure that she is at the Pro Professor Emerita of Education and Social Research Institute, or ESRI, um, Faculty of Health and Education at Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK. Until recently, Maggie was the leader of ESRI's theory and methodology research group and the co-director alongside Liz DeFreitas, who we also had on the series a, little, uh, a few months ago, um, of the Manifold Lab for Biosocial and Ecosensory Studies of Learning and Behavior. Maggie is founder and director of the International Summer Institute in Qualitative Research. She is currently preoccupied with issues of language, sensation, materiality, and the profound implications of the ontological turn for the thinking and doing of applied social and educational research. Her most recent research projects have focused on language and materiality in early childhood. And as Viv said, we do have, I believe, four suggested readings that Maggie shared. Um, it's posted on the webinar series website if you'd like to look at what those readings are. And you can always email Erin Price directly if you need access for those. So Maggie, I must say how excited I am to have this conversation with you today. Personally, your thinking and writing on language, materiality, representation, and young children have been incredibly inspiring and thought-provoking to me as a scholar who focuses on early years and literacies. And I've always enjoyed my interactions with you at conferences. Your honesty and candor when, when I or others ask questions is always so refreshing. Um, it was such a treat to get to dig into your suggested readings for today. Three I had read before and several had multiple colors of highlighters and ink, um, which for me means I've read them many times. Um, and then there was one new publication that I entered into for the first time. And I love seeing the threads and continued thinking on topics that you've been contemplating for years. So thank you so much for agreeing to be in dialogue with us today for this webinar series. So shall we begin? Sure, and thank you, right. Candice. I've always enjoyed my interactions with you as well, I must say. Thanks, Maggie. So our first question that we're asking all of our panelists in this series is, um, is this one. How does your philosophical approach influence your ways of doing inquiry? Uh, okay, well, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that I think it's important to have a philosophical approach. And um, that's always been kind of my starting point, or at least an explicit engagement with theory, if that's different, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it is important to be aware of the kind of conceptual architecture and the ontologies that underpin your practice. Um, so it's about knowing those big questions about subjectivity and agency and reality and change, choice, consciousness, and many others that are newly generated by the uh, ontological turn. Uh, otherwise, um, we run the risk of simply reproducing you know, the banality of, of thought. Um, a few years ago, if I can um, quote myself, which is rather um, uh, pompous, I guess, I, I, I said um, that I felt the, the importance of theory, but you could call it a philosophy as well, is to um, interrupt the reproduction of the bleeding obvious. And I think that's still my position, that if you don't have a, uh, an awareness of the ontological underpinnings of your work, then you can't actually engage in the production of the new. And I think that's, you know, that is the basic tenet of, for me, post philosophies. They're not simply about understanding and critiquing what went before, but they're about producing the new in conditions of uncertainty. Um, and I've actually moved through several different uh, ontologies or orientations in my very lengthy career, um, although they've all been kind of prompted by an, an original and an, exi an existing uh, interest in language. So I've moved through from Chomsky and linguistics to ethnomethodology to critical discourse analysis, deconstruction, and now in some kind of, with reference to those previous orientations, quite uncomfort uncomfortable space of thinking new thoughts. So I've had to do quite a lot of recanting, I guess you could say, of my um, uh, previous thoughts. Um, but one thing that underlies all of those um, uh, approaches that I've moved through has been, I think, um, in different ways, the critique of Enlightenment humanism. And I think that's still something that, you know, despite the many, many other different um, uh, underpinnings of those um, approaches, uh, is still very strong. That idea that we can't any longer um, 
uh, cleave to that assumption that we as humans are the center and the source of meaning and value, and that our capacity for reason sets us apart from um, other species and other entities, um, and that our rationality somehow guarantees um, progress and moral conduct. And, you know, that seems very self-evident given the state that we, we are in now. So, uh, yeah, so language has been at the core of um, humanism. And in my discourse phase, language was both the kind of triumph and the tragedy of humanism because it was the resource through which you would mediate and access the world. But the cost of that was being forever um, uh, cast out of a direct um, access to reality. So those up until then, I guess, they were sort of phil philosophies of lack coupled with human arrogance, I guess. So one of the most direct influences for me has been rethinking um, the status and the meaning of language within post-qualitative or ontological um, speculative philosophies. And I do agree with Barad that um, language has been granted uh, too much importance, I'm quoting her now, something like that, and that we've focused on language at the expense of focusing on difference, on affect, on sensation, on movement and materiality. Uh, so I would agree that language has been granted too much power. Uh, but in terms of my own underpinnings, I don't um, reject language, and I'm sure most people don't. Uh, but I do re now re uh, reject a certain view of language, one that's mainly concerned with um, language as representation or communication between humans, and where the, material, the materiality of language has been continuously marginalized or disavowed, um, and the way in which language entangles with matter and movement and sensation and lodges in the body, but also it's... Um, the incorporeality of language, uh, the way it's animated by what Deleuze called a wild element that exceeds capture by reason and meaning. So um, there is a kind of big shift in my thinking around language. But uh, alongside that kind of revaluation of the role of language, there's a whole range of other assumptions that have an underpinned qualitative research. And that once you challenge one of them, in my case, language, um, a whole load of other uh, assumptions then topple, you know, kind of like dominoes. So you then into um, challenging human exceptionalism and the boundaries uh, that supposedly separate us from other species or separate the disciplines and about the status of consciousness and who gets to have it uh, and about the preeminence um, of reason. So um, I guess that's kind of the main ways in which uh, my philosophical approach in, uh, impacts on my practice, but it also opens up, of course, all those other familiar, really big questions that have come with the ontological turn, which, you know, our relation to the planet and the cosmos and about the risks of um, dismantling human prerogative when large uh, numbers of peoples are still being denied um, full humanity, um, about the limits and the potential for violence uh, in our rage to interpret and understand the world um, and explain it. Uh, so instead, my kind of starting point now, as I said at the beginning, is to um, work for ways of bringing forth the new um, rather than understanding what's gone before. So that lengthy preamble is probably my answer to that question. <laughs> Thanks, Maggie. Um, I loved hearing kind of, the, and I've noticed this in many of our webinars, is this kind of genealogical um, opening. It seems like we should have had a question before our first question that really helps people kind of set up how they came to be where they are now and their thinking and the particular philosophies that they're engaging with. Um, I want to dig in a little bit more just with that question. So one of your readings um, that you suggested was inquiry as divination. Um, right. And it's in QI or qualitative inquiry. And I will say that I had spent a good bit of time with this one. Um, as a colleague, Jennifer Rousel and I had been thinking about magic and we found your article as really helpful in our thinking about magic. Um, so on the, I'm gonna read a couple of um, snippets from that article and just see if you could um, kind of go a little bit more around this notion of inquiry. Cause it seems like in this piece, you're really conceptualizing or thinking about inquiry kind of ontologically and what it is and how we go about doing it. So um, in this piece, you talk about that Deleuze um, 
had talked about that philosophy itself had yet to achieve the creative com um, complicity of life and thought that eminence demands. Philosophy was failing to grasp the dynamic unity in which thought marks life and life activates thought, leaving instead only the choice between, quote, mediocre lives and mad thinkers, end quote. And you talk a little bit more about mad thought and wildlife, which I kind of heard you mention um, yeah. a second ago. Um, and you also describe inquiry as uncertain, um, risk-taking, and magic even comes up in your piece. Um, and then later on in it, you talk about doing inquiry diagrammatically might therefore involve constructing little aleatory machines designed to import catastrophe into the frameworks and methods of research policy and practice to clear a space for creativity and unforeseen outcomes. So talk to us a little bit about like some of those quotes really stuck out to me and how you're thinking about inquiry um, and the notion of mad thinking, um, wildlife, catastrophe, uncertainty. So do you, do you mind commenting a little bit more about that? No, no, I'm happy to do that. Although the extent to which I understand what I wrote myself is always a bit kind of in doubt, but... Um... Uh, I think the thing about uh, aleatory machines, which are machines that can work with chance and can surf the energy of chance, I think, you know, and this is one of the places that magic comes in because it's about um, working with the chancy alignment of forces. Um, for introducing catastrophe, I think that's what I meant by that. And I, I think there was some kind of quote that I used to back it up, but um, it's kind of partly the answer to your next um, main question, which is... Um, I think we're still at the very, very beginning of what will probably be a fairly, if we're lucky, a fairly long um, ontological transformation. Um, and that it's, it's still quite difficult, certainly for me, and I think, you know, for a lot of scholars, to um, grasp the profound conceptual implications of the ontological turn or of speculative thought. So that although we can commit to it, um, uh, if you like, programmatically, and although we can, you know, follow through very small bits of the implications, um, I think we still haven't realised the extent to which ultimately um, qualitative inquiry will become and needs to become, um, I'm kind of partially quoting Deborah Britzman a long time ago here, unintelligible to itself. Um, and that we're still, for me anyway, I'm in a phase where I'm really excited by what's coming next, but I'm still not embracing the catastrophe that that would inaugurate for whatever is, was qualitative inquiry. So I guess that was just, you know, the thing about the aleatory machines were about, about trying to find ways of unsettling that architecture just a little bit in order to glimpse alternative ways of thinking of our relationship to other people, to non-human entities, to the cosmos, um, you know, to the planet, um, and that it's really hard to do that without that catastrophic shaking up, I guess. So that would be one thing. Um, the other, the first quote was about imminence, and I guess that it's the same point, really. It's that whatever turn you're committing to, the, um, the new materialist turn or the ontological turn or the affective turn or the post-representational turn or whatever, all of those um, positions are, um, they assume imminent ontologies, that idea that you can't stand outside the world and judge it and explain it and interpret it, that you're part of the emergence of meaning or data or sense or whatever. Um, and that, that, again, has you know, huge implications for how you think of cause and effect or agency or whatever. So I was just kind of picking up from Deleuze's own quite, you know, um, cautious statement about imminence and that, you know, we all aspire to, I guess, or profess it or see the, um, the importance of it for... Um, for research, but that we're still not in, I guess, you know, you could call it an image of thought or a set of practices where that fits comfortably with all the old, you know, kind of humanist baggage about, you know, ideas coming from inside us or that our thoughts are our own or, you know, all of that stuff. So I don't know if that clarifies at all, but, I, you know, I suspect that was what I was sort of getting at in that paper. 
Yeah. Um, so while we're still on this first question around philosophy and how that shapes your inquiry, um, as I reread or looked across these four papers you suggested, there are threads or certain words or I would say philosophical concepts that come up often in your writing, Maggie. Um, so I'm going to just share a couple of those and maybe um, if you want to elaborate a little bit more. So I noticed in the uh, suggested reading, it was the book chapter, Qualitative Methodology and the New Materialisms, um, that you talk a good bit about sense and nonsense. Um, and this also comes up in some of your other pieces as well. Um, and in the refrain of an agrammatical child article, you discuss order words um, related to power, and you really talk about meaning, um, and which also came up in the inquiry as divination piece as well, like reading data not for meaning that they convey, but unanticipated connections that they afford. So um, it seems like sense and nonsense and this notion of order words comes up a lot um, in your publications and seems to really be important philosophically in how you think about inquiry. Um, could you talk a little bit more maybe about some of those concepts that seem to be really um, important to your thinking? Yeah, I mean, I, that's a good question. I was thinking about that in sort of um, preparing for this session. And um, I do think there's been a sense in which certain um, concepts have emerged for me um, kind of um, progressively. I mean, not in a linear kind of way, but um, in a way that I feel they've kind of chosen me as well as having chosen them. So there's a kind of chain of concepts. And one of them that goes quite far back now is um, that notion of wonder. Uh, and that, that appealed to me because wonder is, you know, itself a liminal quality. Is it in you? Is it out there? You know, it has um, uh, a distinctly non-rational um, element to it. And um, and it's all also a very problematic term because it's complicit with colonialism and so on. So I found that very helpful when I was starting, I guess, to grapple with that notion of the overlooked in conventional research in terms of um, materiality and incorporeality and, you know, leading towards magic and so on. So and then gradually that got replaced, I think. I mean, again, not really in a linear sense, because a lot of these concepts are working in the back of my head, really. Um, uh, Deleuze's notion of sense has been hugely important for me, and the reading and rereading of the logic of sense, a text which I still don't understand. I mean, you know, I always say this when I refer to that, but it's just so true. Um, but without understanding it, it certainly moved me to think of those things about what lies on the border of sense and nonsense and how our notion of language as representational or as you know a vehicle for the exchange of meanings between two human beings is such a limited um, notion of what language is and how it works. And you know, to those carefully unraveled via Acto and um, Lewis Carroll and a whole load of other writers, um, a kind of covert dissident interest in the um, the nonsensical aspects of language, that which is mysterious and it resists recuperation to, uh, to meaning and it's often to do with bodies and breathing and, you know, feelings and sensations. So that just helped me to unlabor unravel that whole notion of the the non or the counter representational in language. Um, so, and that's, you know, that's been very generative for me. Um, and similarly, I think maybe a, around the same time, the, the refrain has been very um, important for me. Um, in um, uh, Deleuze and Guattari's work, the refrain is kind of the first gesture of carving something out of nothing in the world. You know, it's staking your claim. And I found that very interesting and, and important in looking at um, in a kind of obvious way in looking at children's development as um, speakers or as language users and uh, artisans of uh, something more than just representational language. Um, so yeah, I think there's been a, a gradual emergence of um, concepts. Divination is kind of the latest one um, that sort of brings those things together. But that, again, the idea that there's more than rationality in the production of the world. Um, and uh, again, you know, Deleuze and Guattari write a lot about sorcery and, um, you know, its boundary crossing um, troublemaking 
capacities. So I think for me, it's a bit like the way that Deleuze and Guattari describe a practice of concepts in their um, late work, What is Philosophy, where um, it, the, the, the concepts themselves change and morph according to the, the material and the you know, the, the project that they're working with, but nevertheless, they're kind of related. So I think that's, you know, how it's been going for me. Yeah. I don't know which one's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> well, stay tuned. Um, so I love that um, phrase that you were drawing upon from Deleuze and Guattari about what, uh, from what is philosophy is a practice of concepts, which really, I think, leads us into the second question that we've been asking our panelists is, what does this philosophical approach, um, or for you maybe this practice of concepts, make thinkable or possible for inquiry? And so we really um, hoped that our panelists would you know, think about um, the ways that you might approach things that are kind of classified more as traditional practices, such as literature reviews or data collection or analysis and so forth. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how these phil philosophical concepts make thinking and inquiry possible for you. Okay, yeah. Uh, I should also say, we're talking about practice of concepts, if people want to explore that idea further in relation to post-qualitative inquiry, if, um, a few years ago, um, Hilary Lenz Taguchi and Betty St. Pierre edited a special issue, I think of qualitative inquiry, it might be qualitative studies and education, which was entirely around that notion of um, inquiry as a practice of concepts. So, you know, if people want to follow that up, there's lots of, you know, very interesting work in that special issue around that. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of what does it make thinkable or possible for inquiry? Um, well, I think, um, it makes possible, I'm trying to think of, I can never think of which order to deal with points because in a flat ontology, they're all kind of jostling for uh, space. But um, I think latterly, I've been thinking about how it, one of the really important things that um, a speculative or ontological approach makes possible is thinking of new forms of relationality. And that's not just relations, but it is about relations amongst human beings, but about relations um, to other entities and about the way in which relations are uh, structured or ordered. Um, and it makes it possible particularly to think of forms of relation um, beyond the hierarchies that structure conventional qualitative research. Um, they allow us to get a, uh, to go beyond what Deleuze and Guattari call filiation, you know, those relations of father, child, state and subject, um, example and, you know, um, generality, all of those hierarchical relationships that are actually deeply embedded in qualitative research, but they're so deep that we find it hard to think without them. So it, that, part of that is thinking of new relationships between one and many. Um, uh, uh, so going beyond those hierarchical assumptions where conventionally uh, something always rules over something else or represents something else or is more general or more moral or um, more causal or whatever. So it opens us up to new relationships where, as I was saying, we're in the midst of things, not standing above them, but how you can um, think about those. So one of the, another concept I found very useful from um, Deleuze and Guattari in thinking about um, non-hierarchical relations is that notion that he takes from, they take from um, examples of um, sorcery among other things, um, that there are relationships that work more like contagion or um, alliances across um, uh, they, they call them unnatural nuptials amongst things that you wouldn't normally put together. And that's the fundamental notion of the assemblage, you know, things that don't belong, do belong for the particular little machine, you know, assemblage machine that's being built there. And that also relationality is a matter of um, uh, discontinuities and leaps and resonances as much as, you know, linear um, cause and effect. So all of that and just that notion about thinking of different ways of forms of relation shakes up um, 
coming to the more practical question you said, our notion of what counts as data and how we figure in the emergence of data. And it also deeply challenges um, uh, core practices around um, analysis, interpretation, critique, and writing. Um, and that was one of the things that underlies the divination paper, trying to think um, outside of those notions of the analyst or the interpreter or the explainer as the um, arbiter of meaning. But it's hard because, you know, we do have to give up that God trick as Haraway called it, or um, our panoptic immunity to, you know, parse the world, um, which I think was a phrase of the literary critic D.A. Miller. Um, but it does, it does open up those possibilities, uh, I think, to um, think otherwise. And the other thing that it opens up, of course, is the, um, uh, the incursion of other disciplines and other worlds into the uh, domain of qualities of inquiry. And, I, you know, this is very productive, but it's also, you know, perplexing and um, potentially, um, you know, fatal for whatever we thought qualitative inquiry was, because now we are open to and, you know, productively um, disordered by the life sciences and environmentalisms and indigenous philosophies and art practice and uh, mathematics, as Liz uh, de Freitas and Natalie Sinclair spoke about, quantum mechanics, as we know from Barad, and science and technology studies and witchcraft and, you know, um, uh, all of those um, things are pressing on the space of uh, qualitative inquiry, and that's incredibly exciting, but it's also very difficult, and it has ethical issues about appropriating other knowledge systems and so on. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so let me let me um, pull out some of the uh, pieces in your writings that continue this line of conversation. So your new piece, I believe it's a preprint, maybe version, um, the researching without representation. Is that a new one coming out, Maggie? No, I think that's, no, that's old the one. old one. Oh, that actually yeah. is a really, really old one. Yeah, that was in the International Qualitative Studies and Education. Uh, I think the version you sent us was <coughs> the preprint, or it's not the actual. Um, oh, right. It's yes. from the no, article. Yeah. But that the is an older one. What is the divination paper? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So in that one, in the very opening paragraph, the research without representation, you talk about um, non or post representational thought. So you write that. Um, I argue that materialist research must involve non or post representational thought and methods, drawing on contemporary materialist theories that reject the hierarchical logic of representation. Representational thinking still regulates much of what would be considered qualitative methodology. This needs to change. Um, and then similarly, in the refrain of an agrammatical child article, you talk um, on the second page a little bit about the um, materialist research methodologies need to embrace an A signifying effective elements um, that are at play in the becoming child. These haunt qualitative data, but are still often dismissed as junk material that distracts from truth, meaning, or authenticity. Um, and so there seems to be in both of these pieces really this focus on non-representational thought. And I think often uh, qualitative inquiry um, focuses on interpretation, the meaning of the child or the person you're interviewing or what you're observing. And so talk with us a little bit about how these philosophical concepts um, are really opening up different ways of thinking about this notion of meaning and representing the meaning of something else, someone else? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of an example from um, some recent um, work. W one of the things that, as you know, because you're involved in our kind of general uh, area, Abby Hackett, my colleague Abby Hackett and I have been looking at recently is um, uh, images or views of um, early literacy that kind of get away from that notion that the whole task of children is to learn words and then convey meanings to one another. And um, the non-representational um, uh, energy, if you like, from that comes from trying to think about how the child... Um, how things like affect and movement and sensation and atmosphere uh, and um, 
uh, excitements and affects and stuff all come together in what one might call an event of language. So it's trying to get past again that idea that um, uh, uh, it's about words and sentences and even semantics conventionally and trying to get at a more kind of, I guess you could say, synesthetic notion of language um, as involving all the senses um, and also a kind of notion of languages um, uh, or speech or communication as haptic it's about feeling and sensing as much as it's about understanding and, um, and making sense in that literal sense so there's um, I was going to say something else about um, non-representational language oh yes Another example of that, um, another of my colleagues, I mean, I, you know, when we come to talk about support and stuff, I mean, I, I just cannot um, express enough my sort of indebtedness to colleagues like Abby Hackett and Christina McRae and Rachel Holmes. That Christina and I have been working on a project for the Froebel Institute that's kind of revisiting the uh, insights of Froebel's philosophy, you know, um, for contemporary child uh, understandings of children and how they develop and one of the things we've been revisiting in an article that's um, uh, just about to come out I think or it may have come out is about the overlooked role of or the the, the disparaged role of imitation in early child uh, language development where the you know the usual prevailing idea has been that uh, imitation is just kind of some empty mimicry and it's not you know real expression because it's not coming um, from inside the child and we've kind of tried to open up that notion of imitation to to look at the um, the kind of overlooked forms of relation that imitation involves which are more about contagion and attunement to one another and about the unfolding of an event from inside the actions of what the children are doing as much as what they say so again it's that attempt to find a dimension other dimensions or other forces, if you like, at work in um, uh, language that are not just about meaning and um, representing the world. I must say that I'm halfway through Abby's new book. It's on my table oh, by my sofa. Yes, yeah, so she has a new book for those that might be interested that yes. um, is really um, provoking a lot of thought for me to think about language and literacies with our very youngest. Um, yeah. Um, children. So, yeah. Um, so a little bit more here before we move on to the third question. And um, I think that as we're thinking about this notion of non-representation or thinking about language as more than about meaning, um, I would imagine that some of the students who are joining us or even, you know, faculty who are still trying to engage in this work, thinking about um, publication and journals and how we disseminate and, and um, share our work with others. And so, um, in two of the suggested readings today, um, you talk a little bit more um, related to this. So I want to share two quotes and, and see what your thoughts are. In the inquiry as divination piece on the last page of the article, you say that diagrammatic or divinatory practice demands that we give up our inclination for narratives as well as logical coherence. Um, and then in the uh, rep researching without representation one, if I look toward the end of that piece, you state that qualitative inquiry might stop looking for depth and hoping for height. Um, so I guess, you know, help us think about as, as, new, as new graduate students that are joining the series, as people who have maybe been doing this work for many decades, um, there's, there's this hard sense of trying to make sense of what does it mean to stop looking for depth and hoping for height? And what does it mean if we give up narrative and, and logical coherence and the narratives that we are trying to tell and somewhat represent kind of in the publications that we share or presentations that we give? Yeah, great question again. And uh, what was it? Looking giving up looking for depth and hoping for height sounds like the yeah title. stop looking for depth and hoping bad, for height um, yeah it's like a title of a bad country song i mean i'm embarrassed at having written that actually but um i suppose it's it's that thing that representational thing again of always taking something as an example or an instance of something else you know like a stage of development or a deeper meaning or a theme or whatever um not that there's any reason not to look for generality, sameness, coherence. I mean, I, 
I probably haven't made it clear enough in my work that I, I don't oppose those because I think they're important. But it's about also finding those other unruly things that happen um, uh, that are also important in the man in the unfolding of of lives. So um, it's just it, particularly if you look at you know I think it's no accident that early childhood has been such a fertile space for um, post qualitative um, work. Um, precisely because children themselves are these liminal entities on the border between you know the, the what we think of as the animal and the embodied and you know this sort of um so-called higher order stuff about language and um uh, conceptualization but looked at another way what they're doing um in traversing the worlds of sensation and matter and materiality um as well as acquiring these coherence and uh, depth things is um, tremendously important. And probably I was trying to argue in the divination article, you know, still important for um, understanding what adults or, you know, engaging with what, what uh, adults and other entities do, um, which was what underpinned Deleuze's, uh, Deleuze and Gautier's, you know, very contentious notions of becoming child. Uh, and becoming women and so on, these kind of non-linear, uh, non-representational, energetic movements that, you know, keep life going. So I think that's, that's what I was getting at there. But I also think I haven't fully worked out my own position on the role of narrative yet, because I tend to think of narrative as, you know, highly structured, deeply discursive. But of course, it's also, you know, narratives in the form of myths and creation stories and pocket devices for getting you through your life in hard times and so on. It's tr tremendously important. And, you know, I was struck by something Jerry Rusick said a while back about narratives as being themselves living material things with force in the world. So, I've been a bit dismissive of narrative as this kind of structured representational stuff, but I think what you know one of the things I would definitely want to think about again, and this is, your question helps me do it, is to rethink the notion of narrative in a more material, um, speculative way. I guess. Yeah. I love that. I've taught a narrative inquiry class here at Mizzou every couple of years, and as the years have progressed, it's. Um, intersected more with conversations and students in that class about like, yeah, what is narrative? How are we ontologically thinking about it? And if we think about it with some of these post philosophies, what might that open up? So I'd love to hear as you continue to explore that kind of where, where you go with that. Um, let's shift to our third question. And this question really comes from just a lot of uh, chatter and conversation in the broader field of qualitative research about methodologies and methods especially when someone is um, aligning with or claiming to engage in different post-philosophical concepts. So where are you sitting now in, in kind of this discussion on methodology and methods when inspired or, you know, when you're putting to work some of these concepts? Yeah, um, I'm not really particularly invested in the contemporary debate. That's quite a lively one. And I like, I like the debate, but I don't really have a dog in the fight, I suppose, um, about, you know, foreign against method in itself. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Um, I'm obviously not committed to notions of method as recipes or how-to uh, resources, um, or in method as the search for generality and sameness and hierarchy, you know, looking for the themes that underlie um, the messiness of surfaces and so on. So in that sense, I definitely don't feel that kind of methods particularly helpful, or at least not as the main way that you're doing it. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's, it's probably not important whether you call them methods or, you know, resources or maybe techniques or exercises, but I do think you need some um, protocols, I suppose, um, for bringing forth the unpredictable. You know, one of the things about imminent ontologies, and I wrote about this at some length, I guess, in the divination um, uh, paper, is that um, if you, you're in a paradoxical situation of being open to the emergence of the unforeseen, but how do you do that? You can't, you know, you can't have methods that define what that will be before it happens but you do need some way of um 
uh, preparing for or sensing the potential emergence of something um, new, sensing it perhaps. Um, and I don't think that the best way to do this, and, and it's kind of sometimes assumed in, in some of the um, writings that are, you know, really great pieces of writing again, but it's about a completely open-ended state of play that you, you know, you, you play and then you wait for something to happen, um, uh, or you just wait and see something happening. And um, that doesn't really work for me. Um, I actually believe in some notion of the sort of patience as part of an experimental attitude of preparation for the um, arrival of the new, but it's just so difficult to um, formulate that in a way that um, is helpful to people, I suppose. Um, but I, you know, part of it is I think you need methods, but they need to be kind of bespoke methods, you know, ones that you fashion for yourself in the middle of things. And I think partly that conceptual work I talked about earlier is important um, for that. And um, in the divination paper, I talk about uh, Deleuze and Guattari's notion of the um, the practice of uh, uh, the smith or the metallurgist whose relation to the materiality of um, the substance is so um, um, completely embroiled in it that you know the, the method is a matter of it, you need ambulant methods as Guattari called them that follow the contours of what you're examining so you can't have methods I totally agree that stand apart from it and say this is what qualitative inquiry should look like but you do need to um, have some sense of method even if it unfolds from particularly that it must unfold from the ongoing imminent immersion in the field. Um, and I can think of one um, example that um, uh, has really made an impact on me in e recent years. So um, the work of Emma Reynolds and Gabriel Ivanson, another one of my colleagues um, in Esri at Manchester Metropolitan, they do amazing work with young people um, uh, and they draw on um, imminent ontologies and on arts-based um, practices, but they emerge out of the unfolding research. So they have one fantastic paper, um, and I can send the um, reference on later, but it's the way in which arising out of the, um, um, which I, I think were probably fairly conventional interviews with young people living in ex uh, and experiencing extreme poverty in North Wales, um, and, uh, and particularly the young women's experiences of um, um, harassment and, you know, bad times with, with boys and so on. Um, an artifact emerged, which was this chair that became a kind of totemic, almost, you know, quasi-magical repository of their fears and the injustices and the hopes and the promises. And they decorated this chair um, and it came to stand for their experience in a very non-representational way. But the thing that really struck me about that was the way in which that chair, which you might call some kind of method, was then played forward into the um, arenas in which policy makers and those in power impact on uh, young people's lives. So, you know, it took the stage at a very auspicious uh, convention or conference of um, Welsh policy makers and it appeared at the Summer Institute and so on. So, uh, trying to, to relate that back to method, it wasn't that Emma and Gabriel felt that anything would work. It was that what worked was so deeply embedded in the specification of the problem and the way that it unfolded that it had its own rationale. So again, you know, I seem to be able to, unable to answer the question in any sort of straightforward way, but I, I guess the methods emerge from the project for me. And that's partly why the conceptual frameworks of my work has changed as well. Um, just to, as a kind of sideline to that, I don't see any reason not to do the sorts of things that um, qualitative research has often done in terms of methods. So things like interviews or observations or whatever. But I do think there's a certain for me, anyway, there's an impulse to break those methods while using them. 
uh, and you know force them to reveal un unforeseen um, things. So you know, partly I got embarked on this whole post qualitative um, speculative uh, route um, by becoming more and more fascinated by the stuff in children's language development that was reckoned to be irrelevant. You know, the sort of laughs or coughs or sniffs or whatever. So, um, but working from quite conventional video data, for example. So I think you can, just thinking of something that might be of practical help for once to um, your students and, and um, uh, colleagues, you can, you, I don't see that there's any a priori reason not to use, um, you know, the, the kind of conventional paraphernalia of qualitative research interviews, whatever. But I do think there's, you have to do something differently with them uh, and you know alongside them um, and call that method maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well let me follow up um, as we're talking about that with a couple things that did um, surface as I reread your pieces and so I might be remiss if I don't bring this phrase in because it's a phrase I hear often quoted from you. I think it's been a phrase that students I've worked with have found really helpful in trying to explain to other committee members or others um, kind of why particular data is the data that they engage with? And you probably know the phrase I'm gonna ask you is this phrase about data glowing. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to be something that people really have um, you know, hooked onto in your writing. And you talk in that piece, researching without representation about data making itself intelligible to us and data glowing. Um, and then the book chapter, The Qualitative Methodology, New Materialism, is you start with a question in that chapter about what does method want? Which I think is a really provoking question. Um, and in that chapter, you talk a lot about the status of data and the status of language. Um, and you end that chapter um, talking about methodology as unintelligible to itself. Um, so it seems like data makes itself intelligible to us, methodology as unintelligible to itself. So um, maybe just a little bit around that notion of data glowing, data making itself intelligible to us. And I just love that question, what does method want? <laughs> Yeah, um, I like that question too. I don't know that I had any satisfactory answer to it. Um, I'm glad that people have found the notion of the glow um, helpful. Um, I have had some qualms about it because it's it, it's quite susceptible to being read in a um, uh, sort of you know slightly romantic or um, individual way that you know data is what appeals to me, um, and you know you you don't have to take into account other stuff. I guess what I meant by that was that it, um, it, it does glow, but it only glows, I think, within an emergent um, assemblage or um, a set of problems. So the glow is not there all the time. It's there when, um, I guess in Barad's sense, when the agential cut is made and then something acquires a, um, an import or a sense that wasn't there before. And, you know, that, that's always worth going with when that happens, um, even if it's on an individualistic kind of basis. Um, if, if something starts to emerge and it builds up an energy, um, that there's probably something more going on there than we know. And it's almost certainly about something like affect or something non-representational or something about something that would never really be picked up adequately within a coding scheme even though and you know i wrote another article quite a long time ago called classification and wonder which was about coding you know the thing about you know looking for order that can be a productive source of that glue because you get stuff that doesn't fit and rather than ignoring it it kind of you know comes to pass so uh, but in terms of the intelligibility um yeah i don't know if intelligibility is the word i would use now but it's again it's that the um the intelligible emerges within a particular assemblage or in a particular context it's not necessarily you know completely um there across all contexts um yeah, I'll have to have a think again, I think, about the glow. Um, partly it's about that notion of um, uh, something having, a, um, I, I suppose it, it kind of relates to the later stuff I've been thinking about, about 
um, about witchcraft and um, uh, speculative philosophies, where the glow is something that's very much um, has a power um, and an atmosphere that can't be summarized in conventional terms, in terms of you know meaning systems and so on. So there's probably still something in there. What I love hearing today, Maggie, is I probably could start tallying the times that you say something about, I'm still thinking about that, or I might say that differently now. And so I love that invitation and for us all to think about how even if something's published in an article that our thinking still is shifting and changing and we're still wrestling with things. So I really appreciate hearing your transparency with that. Um, our final question is connected to that really is about trying to make transparent um, how to go about doing this work in the academy and especially for graduate students who join us or people who are just recently graduated and moving into different academic positions. We wanted this webinar series to be a place to open conversations. Um, often what gets published in a journal looks so neat and tidy in some sense and there's a lot that went into getting it there. Um, so we want to just open a space here before we move into our Q&A time um, for you to share a little bit about suggestions, advice, things that you've learned over your years in the academy as you've mentored people engaging in post philosophies, whether it's related to publications or grants or kind of other things that are expected of academics. Um, what might you share with those who are here today? Yeah, okay. I mean, I should say before um, I go on again that I think you, the, the, this webinar series has been an incredibly productive space for doing exactly the sort of work that you're talking about, which is about opening up in a, you know, a much more leisurely way, I think, the sort of way this field is developing and where its gaps and its tentativeness is and its potential are. So, I mean, that sort of um, forums or um, avenues for that kind of collective work across spaces and time zones is, you know, is an important part of it. And it's something that definitely underlies our own work at Manchester Metropolitan as well. Um, in terms of supporting uh, graduate students and uh, colleagues, I mean, the UK context differs from some other countries, obviously, both in terms of its graduate education and the general way that universities work. So it's not necessarily generalizable. You know, for instance, doctoral candidates uh, in the um, UK have to have at least one external examiner. Um, so it's important for very pragmatic reasons to have a, you know, a cadre of academics and other institutions and countries who are competent to judge the work of students that are undertaking unorthodox um, uh, and new methodologies. So that's one reason, it's far from the only one, but it's one reason why in the Education and Social Research Institute, DESRI, uh, we put so much effort into fostering networks and maintaining international debate with colleagues um, in the UK and elsewhere. Uh, not so that these people will wave our candidates through, but so that they'll be competent to evaluate the work. And more importantly, this international um, reach uh, introduces our graduate students to debate at this particular leading age, uh, edge of the field. So we feel that these uh, international um, occasions of which your webinar is most definitely one is very important to our students, not just in getting institutional support internally but in you know helping them to um, progress so um, I think generally the work of supporting students and early career researchers you know it does involve both internal and for us external culture building so Esri has been going for 15 years or so um, and it's very much a working research community so you know Esri members don't only teach and supervise graduate students and teach other levels, but they're actively involved in doing externally funded research. And um, in that sense, we're kind of jobbing researchers as well who take the business of research very seriously. I mean, securing external research funding is a very politicized thing these days, and it's a marker of you know, so-called excellence and so on. And there are lots of problems with that, but nevertheless, um, one of the things that perhaps makes us distinct from other um, university contexts is that notion of a community of researchers who are not just academics within university departments, but have we see ourselves as having obligations 
to do important research and to develop methodologies for doing that better. And I think we try to um, uh, involve our students in that collective um, endeavour in kind of generating a sort of research sensibility, if you like. Um, there's a lot of things in university life today in the UK and elsewhere that tend to squeeze out or to managerialize research, um, sideline it in terms of, you know, student recruitment and teaching and so on. And I think there's a certain um, stubborn uh, work of resistance that we've done in Esri to constantly remind ourselves and others that research is important, not just to train the next generation of graduate students, but in order to do socially valuable research. So I think that kind of... Um, uh, is important and we do a lot of internal things uh, to um, support you know new researchers and, and graduate students I mean we're one of the very few places that has a research group specifically dedicated to theory and methodology and we kind of constantly um, emphasize the importance of that and not just post philosophies I mean there are many other uh, approaches to research that go on in Esri people using Bourdieu or Lacan or grounded theory or you know quantitative methods so that's a more uh, general thing um, and uh, we run a lot of things like reading groups um, Liz de Freitas has developed this fantastic intensive reading group um, methodology where three or four days are set aside for intensive reading of components of important books either related along themes or delving into the work of Gleason was one of the recent ones and we've read Bergson also but the thing is that one person champions that particular book for the day and kind of kicks off and everyone else has read it and you kind of try to build up a momentum of serious engagement with reading uh, and I think that's important and there's always reading groups going on in every and so on um, and we also organize the Summer Institute uh, in Qualitative Research, although that's not run for a few years for various reasons. But again, the intention there was twofold. It was both to take part in the, um, the development of theory and methodology um, uh, internationally by having people who are really expert and really involved in it coming and talking and having time to do that over the space of a week but also to introduce our students to that um that practice of taking research seriously and that's been you know the summer institute's been very um uh, productive and a lot of the people who've been in this webinar series have been keynotes or they've attended and um uh, more generally we've tended to try to make esri this kind of um one of one of the locuses or loci of um, qualitative uh, methodology. And we have lots of visiting scholars. Of course, Candice, you've been on more than one occasion, I think, to, um, to um, Esri and, you know, shared your work with us. And um, uh, we, we just have this constant interchange and little um, uh, particular groups you know, who are based around literacies or around mathematics, and we have different contacts with people in Scandinavia and Australia and um, South Africa and so on. So I think, you know, just trying to summarize what sounds like a piece of, you know, um, blatant self-advertising really, but I think it's that we take, we hope that our students benefit from that sense of research being um, a, a public good as well as an intellectual kind of um, uh, activity for people to acquire and of course we do all sorts of things wrongly some people don't feel they belong we are much narrower than we should be we've probably fallen down on lots of areas so it's not like a perfect place and it's constantly subject to um, uh, you know pressures of performativity and quality audit and so on but um yeah, I think for me, it has been that con continuing sense of a, we've been privileged to have a, a sense of a collective within a traditional university, so um, which has, you know, worked okay, but it only works as long as the current climate allows it. So. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. I've heard that theme from a lot of panelists. It's about yeah. creating these spaces within yeah. um, and having people that help to nurture and and spend their time creating these, you know, whether it's webinars or seminars or reading yeah. groups, et cetera, that really help to connect people internationally as well. Um, we're going to shift our attention to the questions that are coming in from those who are joining us today on the webinar. So Viv's going to give us a little direction and guidance on that, and then we're going to um, jump into those, Maggie. Great. Yeah, thanks. That was wonderful to hear the two of you interchanging. And I, I loved your readings, Maggie. I have read them many, many times before. <laughs> Always go back to them. I find your writing <coughs> very clear. And I, like Candace, I like the way that it, your, your thoughts thread through your readings. And if there aren't too many questions, I really have a question I would like to ask you about one of the readings. The first um, question that we're going to jump into, Erin and I, is an easy one, and it's a follow-up to your Summer Institute. I think there's somebody out in the chat who's keen to find out if it's if it's going to continue. Um, I know that people who've attended it have, you know, it's been a very um, wonderful experience. So maybe just a short answer to that first. Oh, well, yes, I mean, I think we um, very much hope that it will. It's still, um, there's still an uncertainty about the, um, you know, post-pandemic opening up. And there's also an issue about, which is kind of a methodological issue, about the, the importance of the face-to-face -face and sustained interaction in real time amongst bodies who go to the pub and, or, you know, the cafe and form new alliances uh, in, uh, in that face-to-face -face context. So we have thought of doing it, you know, online. Um, but it would be hard to do that and maintain the intensity of that sort of face-to-faceness. But I think there will definitely be, um, you know, some form of summer institute again, or something, something else that will be, um, you know, of a similar kind of principle. Yes, yeah. it's quite difficult to get into the UK now. Almost impossible, I know, for South Africans because it's hugely expensive to quarantine. Absolutely. Even, and, you know, yeah. to be honest, you probably wouldn't want to. We've got one of the highest no, infections. I see that. The world, yeah. It's very know, distressing. Yeah. Which is, yeah. <laughs> but yes, the spirit of the Summer Institute, I am almost certain, will live on. Yeah. We look forward to hearing more. <laughs> so there was a question about the ways in which language limits the speaker. So this uh, person pointed to an example of people speaking one verbal language, um, not able to think in accordance with speakers of another language. So how might we address such events? Um, so is this about um, thinking about translation across different actual languages, I guess? Yes. Yeah. And um, the thinking, the thinking that uh, is perhaps structured by the-, the Right, language. okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that is a very um, important question, that idea of to what, what extent is thought um, shaped and structured by the particular language that you're uh, speaking. And I'm particularly aware of that, I guess, because, you know, the um, Anglo languages and the Germanic languages, uh, languages of the global north are so structured by precisely those um, uh, relationships that um, post-qualitative philosophies are trying to get away from, you know, transitivity, cause and effect, subject and object, and so on. So I think it's actually potentially more difficult for us to think in a more um, relational, um, uh, post-human way than, you know, languages like some of the indigenous languages, which have a particularly, you know, completely different notion of, um, significance of temporality and uh, relations with the uh, non-human world and so on. So I think, yeah, I, it's definitely the case that the languages that we, um, that inhabit us, you know, are our resource for engaging with the world. And I wouldn't want to deny that, but they are also 
um, possibly incommensurable in ways that um, uh, are quite difficult to overcome. But I would also add that, I mean, I, I feel that's the case even inside a language, if you like. There are so many, you know, that idea that there is a meaning and it's our job to extract it. I think one of the reasons I had difficulty answering some of Candace's questions about stuff that I myself wrote was that, you know, at a distance, or even at the time that I wrote them, I can't really say what they mean, you know. Um, so maybe one of the messages is that we can we can do more than we thought with um, uh, the notion of dimly sensing things that are going on rather than knowing exactly what they mean. And that, you know, one way of approaching communication across languages might be to learn to be more comfortable with getting the gist of things or the, the drift of them, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Good question, though. <laughs> While we wait for more people to put, oh, I see there is one more question now. Um, let's just have a look. Um, thanks for the super session. I'd be interested to hear Maggie's thoughts on how we might better integrate speculative ways of thinking and practicing across different disciplines relating to language and the body. For example, physics, neuroscience, psychology, health. Yeah. Um, it's such an important thing and so, it, but very difficult to um, operationalize. I mean, one of the ways that we do it internally and um, when we Liz and I set up the Manifold Lab, the Biosocial Lab as it was then, was to, <coughs> excuse me, explicitly make links with um, researchers in other disciplines who would come and talk with us, you know, so we had people from neuroscience and from biology, uh, from sports science and so on, come and spend some time and we had some, David Roussel help, helped to arrange some events where they were spread over a couple of days where the idea would be to bring people um, together to um, think about not so much about language and the body as about, you know, biosocial um, currents in general. Although we, Abby Hackett did organize one also on literacy and materiality um, uh, and the body. Um, but, um, my main thought on that goes back to what I was saying about us being still so much at the very, um, the very beginnings of understanding how to bring all these, what were previously separate disciplines into productive uh, and generative um, dialogue. I mean, there's, you know, there's great examples now um, of wonderful writing that is doing that. Anna Singh's books. Um, Elizabeth Wilson's got a wonderful book called Gut Feminism. There's a great book by the anthropologist Eduardo Cohn called How Forests Think. There are lots of, you know, boundary, you know, obviously Karen Brad's book, which, you know, introduced all of us to, uh, well, not all of us, but certainly me and many others to quantum mechanics and so on. So I think there's already a kind of... Um, there's an energy and a, um, a kind of frisson of what's possible, but we're um, still at the start, and we're kind of um, hampered still by the kind of um, the politics, I guess, of interdisciplinarity, where you know different disciplines have different, not just different worldviews, but different places in the pecking order, and um, you know how you bring those together. Um, it's quite a live question for me at the moment, actually, about you know how you can bring all those um, uh, disciplines together in a speculative way, rather than allowing each of them just to reside in their own expertise and authority. Um, I recently completed an article with Rika Huti in Finland, um, which is currently under review, and it was called Insect Thinking. And it started off from a exploration between Rika and myself of particular encounters with insects in our early childhood because we were trying to work across you know species boundaries and think of animal studies and so on 
and we, Rika was talking about early encounters with um, mosquitoes and I was talking about early encounters with cockroaches um, and um, uh, what one would make of that. Um, and I, I ended up really holding the paper up in getting finished because I got kind of paralyzed by the possibilities that were opened up by following the cockroach into neuroscience where people do experiments on it and it's role in the you know reproduction of poverty and illness and asthma and its uses you know in jewelry and victorian you know sort of fashion and um the way in which it was linked with slavery and came over it, but the problem was it was so generative that i got almost paralyzed by the um, possibilities and the sheer impossibility of ever knowing enough about any of these disciplines to kind of take that stuff forward. So um, I guess my answer in the end would be, you know, we just need to keep, you know, keep trying with as good a will as we can to to do that sort of, um, you know, transdiscipline, ta transdisciplinary work. There are no questions at the moment. Um, so I thought I might ask the one that that came up when I was reading your papers, Maggie. And there was one couple of sentences that I did a double take. Everything else was sort of making a lot of sense. And I want to see if I can find it. It's about um, Claire Colebrook and uh, the privileging of relationality. Mm -hmm. um, and um, incommensurability and uh, uh, you say this would involve a radical cut or refusal of relationality at least of its hegemonic form so um, if you could just sort of explain how you know because I you know relationality is so much at the yeah. core of everything um you know that we're doing so how does this work yeah. yeah um yeah that was prompted by an article um of claire colbrooks that i really really loved and I, again sorry to keep going on about the limits of my own understanding but uh, it's very difficult paper but she was she was arguing i think it's part of a general argument that um colbrook puts forward which is a uh, uh, a critique of what she sees as one tendency within contemporary sort of um, uh, new materialist and uh, affect uh, approaches to conceive of relationality as this unbounded, haptic, very positive notion of, you know, total interconnectedness. And she, she's written in several places. One of them is in one of her two books on the Anthropocene, I've forgotten the titles of them now, where she, uh, and she has an article as well that also influenced me, um, where she talks about sort of hyper affective disorder. And she's saying that there's, you know, the kind of total, the assumption of total, you know, the sort of positive um, swarming uh, vision of, of total haptic interconnectedness um, is ultimately, and unworkable or um, uh, almost a kind of static notion if you have no way of accounting for difference and distance. And she sees the role of theory as being that. So she's got this notion of um, un, un, um, unlimited relationality as not a helpful thing to think with. And then in the article, I think that I was discussing there about in, in, incommensurability and the radical cut, she was looking particularly at that, the, the, the politics of that notion of relationality when it's taken into contexts of um, post-colonial or decolonial art practices where the idea is that you just bring everything together and you can forge relationships that didn't, um, didn't work before and she had a very pessimistic view of the um, um, the ethics of that gesture which she saw as and she was drawing on Eve Tuck Eve Tuck's work as well of the the price that's always paid by um, 
those on the margins or the subaltern when um, uh, you know those who come from the global north I guess take it upon themselves to be the guarantors of relationality and you know her, her kind of she had an, a very interesting example of um, an artwork that I won't go into, but that, that, that exemplified what she was, I don't know if she was arguing for it or, or simply saying, let's think about this, that sometimes you, you, you must stop seeking um, relationality because of the ethics and the politics, as well as the ontological inequalities that it brings and accept incommensurable worlds. Um, there's an, also there was an article a long time ago by um, uh, Alison Jones and Takawiho Hoskins uh, in um, New Zealand where they were talking also about incommensurable realities and mm. theirs was in the context of Maori uh, and Pakeha um, positions on um, uh, the treaty you know uh, of Waitangi and they were arguing it's not that it was they're arguing not for a relativity of, you know, um, uh, different points of view, but of, of a radical incommensurability um, of realities. So that's that space that that was playing in. And again, um, it's uh, unhelpful to say it, I suppose, but that is an, another area that I am currently wondering about, because on the one hand, you know, I think the relation, relational ontologies are so productive. But on the other hand, I have a kind of, not suspicion, but reservation about them. Some of the work I re read is stylistically very warm and um, it has this expansive generosity about the way in which, you know, everyone should relate to one another. And part of me doesn't buy that on grounds that I haven't really figured out and some particular writers who I wouldn't name because I love their work in other senses but their their style is so kind of flowy and warm and you know it almost seems to be at risk of a collapse back into romanticism or you know valorizing of feeling in a kind of old way so yeah uh, yeah I know what you're getting it I was going to <laughs> Comments oh, on, on the romanticization. Talk. So yeah. yeah, it does make sense in that way. Yeah. That uh, yeah, this and I think the notion of affirmation is a more complex one. I mean, I quite like Erin Manning's um, work on that. That it's not just about affirming something. It's it's much more complex than that. Yeah. But I yeah. think people have taken it into that sort of you know positivity about everything and uh, sort of slightly apolitical views of the world you know yeah i suppose as anything else it can be used in very um you know um productive and generative ways and it can also be used in roman romanticizing ways yeah, and you don't want to get in a position of arbitrating which are the good and the bad ways either, because, you know, that's not affirmative either. But I think, oh, kind of making me think now of the previous question about different languages, um, partly it's because in the English language, notions of uh, affirmation and um, care, which is another big, you know, concept at the moment, they do carry that kind of um, humanist um, uh, sort of positivity um, that partly you want and you want to extend it to you know animals and the non-human but you're also aware that there's a whole baggage underlying it so yeah and uh, care is another one that I've been thinking of at the moment as well as affirmation yeah it's a huge yeah. field um, yeah care yeah. you know and yeah. there's so many different positions yeah in that field I think well, I, I see we're about two minutes away. Erin, did you have any final question or anything? I saw you had unmuted, so I wasn't sure if you wanted to wrap us up in any way before we say our goodbyes and close the session. 
Well, I had unmuted because I was going to read a section that I think is what Viv was referring to from Maggie's work, but I don't, I don't know if we have time at this point. Maybe you could put in the chat if the page and the article it's from, from the suggested reading. So if people want to go find it, um, or maybe just tell us which article you found it in. So people it's from the divination it. article. Okay. And so particularly the conclusion kind of, I, I feel like is, is very um, eloquently written, Maggie. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for finding that, Erin, and for letting other people know which piece it was in so they can go back and look at it. Well, Maggie, I just want to say thank you so much. What a way to end our 14 um, webinars in this series. It was so generative. Um, as I said earlier, I love your um, the way that you're so humble and honest and just transparent about where you are and how you continue to think about things and, and change your mind, so to speak, or to expand or grow in those ways. And I think that's really important for newer um, emerging scholars to hear in our field um, from somebody who's been doing this for um, several decades. Um, so thanks so much, Maggie, for, for saying yes, for ending our series.